Cool. Well, it is 12 o'clock. I'm going to get started. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. A little more people pop in uh, in the waiting room and hopefully get into this. But uh, we are super excited to have uh, Georgina Terry with us today. Georgina is, as we were just discussing, the first female frame builder in America, uh, possibly the world, and uh, was the first female woman to bring uh, female designed bikes, specific, well, specifically female designed bikes, to market. Um, she's also the mind behind the iconic Terry brand. I'm sure we've all seen those saddles around if you've ever been to a bike shop um, and the clothing line. And nowadays, G Georgina is building custom made bikes for uh, people all across the country. So, uh, Georgina, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. I was really looking forward to this. Awesome. We will. We were very excited too. Um, I guess to start off with a couple quick questions. Uh, so let's go, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, where are you coming from today? Uh, your favorite bike ride? And if you had to bring one book with you on a desert island, what would it be? Oh man. <laughs> okay, I am coming to you from Penfield, New York, which is a suburb of Rochester. Uh, and uh, Favorite bike ride, uh, Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge on the eastern shore of Maryland, which is, I went down there several years ago and absolutely fell in love with it. I, I almost missed my cousin's wedding, which is, was my main reason for going down there, but the bike ride was so good. I kind of thought, gosh, can I just keep doing this and skip the wedding? But I did go to the wedding in the end. Uh, right. and, and wow, the book, the book, what would the book be? Hi. That, that's a really hard one. I don't really know what the answer to that question is, to tell you the truth. Okay. Uh, let me think about it as we go on, you know, and it'll pop into my head and then I'll tell you. Okay. Well, let's <laughs> open that right now with favorite flavor of ice cream. We got that. Oh, chocolate. Absolutely. Perfect. Right away. <laughs> I have to think a, a millisecond about that one. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, well, you know, you have such an interesting story um, and you know, how you came to be who you are today. I would just want to know, like, uh, where are you from originally? Where'd you go? Yeah, up? I you am originally from like Montgomery, Alabama, which is, I always hear the Southern accent in my voice, but other people tell me they don't pick up on it at all. <clears throat> but I was actually born in Washington, D.C., uh, because my mother didn't trust the obstetricians in Montgomery. <laughs> So I was born in Washington, but then raised in Montgomery, Alabama. And that's where I first got into bicycling a little bit late. I was 12 years old uh, when I finally got a bike and started riding it and didn't give it up until I was around 17 or so and finally got a driver's license. But but that was that was the beginning of it right there. And uh, from there, I uh, went to college in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Chatham College and Carnegie Mellon University mm -hmm. and continued bicycling in Pittsburgh. Uh, and that's where I think I really got interested in the mechanical aspect of bicycling and the whole idea of there was a lot of stuff I could do on my own, thanks to the local bike shop there, Cranix, that really encouraged me to, why pay me to fix a flat tire when you can figure it out on your own? <laughs> and why pay me to repack your hubs when you can figure that out too? Mm -hmm. So that, that was all kind of the breeding ground, I think, for eventually getting into frame building. Were you intimidated at all by you no know, taking on bicycle mechanics in the beginning? No. <laughs> I just, I just, I love that stuff. That's why I ended up going to Carnegie Mellon and getting into mechanical engineering. I don't know, that stuff just really turns me on much more so than just liberal arts or stuff like that. I just, I just like playing around with stuff. It's really exciting. <laughs> I, I teach this when I, I teach a fix a bike class often for BCM. And I always say one of the best things about bikes is like the perfect entry into, you know, systems thinking and, you know, mechanics, because it's pretty forgiving and pretty simple for the most part. Yeah, it's nice too, because, you know, everything you're working on is right there in front of you. It's like nothing is hidden behind a black box or something. You've got to figure out what's going on inside. Yeah. You just have to look and observe and think a little bit. Exactly. Awesome. Um, super cool. Did you have any like certain seminal moments in your life that kind of sent you down that direction towards Carnegie Mellon and engineering? 
Yeah, I definitely did. Uh, I, I went to Chatham College at first and got a, a bachelor's degree there uh, in liberal arts. But I was really getting into bicycling at the time. And I was a little bit frustrated sometimes at Chatham because they didn't have, they weren't strong in the science area at all. I mean, they had a basic physics course and stuff like that. And I, I started following a very traditional path in the financial market and business market as as an employee. And I just didn't like that stuff at all. I just, all I want to do is ride my darn bicycle. <laughs> it was kind of crazy. So I thought, you know, I really need to figure out who I am or where I'm going because I am not on the right path. <laughs> One should not be this miserable all the time. Uh, so I went to a psychological testing service in Pittsburgh that uh, advised people on where they should be going and where their strengths were and their weaknesses and all this stuff and spend a day of doing this test, I'd rather do this than that. I'd rather do that than this, you know, that kind of stuff. And at the end of the day, the psychologist who was running the test said, wow, I've never seen anyone with such a clear cut direction as you have. She said, you need to get into mechanical stuff, mechanical engineering, and tie that in with something that's related to the outdoors. I mean, there's nothing else in your life that's going to make you happy. Yeah, that's where you need to go. So at that point, I thought, wow, why don't I take an evening course at Carnegie Mellon and see if I really like this stuff? So I took a course in thermodynamics and, and absolutely loved it. And uh, then ended up going to Carnegie Mellon and started off on an engineering path from there, bicycling the entire time. Nice. Was, um, no, working, going down engineering, was there like, did you enjoy the, you know, the, theoretical side of it more did you like you know the hands-on part of it more what was the thing that really drew you into it more I think it was a little bit of both I was fortunate uh, I worked for the nuclear service division of Westinghouse and later on for Xerox here in Rochester and in both cases it was a little bit of both trying to figure out what was going on theoretically and then making that work in a copier or a printer or on a nuclear reactor cleaning tool something like that so yeah, it was really a lot of hands-on stuff, which I think was fun. Awesome. So you started off, um, you know, working on your bike. What drove you to say, hey, I want to build one of these things from the ground up? Well, you know, bicycles were a lot simpler back then than they are now. I mean, nobody was using disc brakes or electronic shifting or anything. So it was really pretty basic. And it was it was easy for me to get to the point <clears throat> where I could disassemble an entire bike and put it back together again, which I, I did after every ride because I was worried that it might be too dirty and I wanted to clean it. <clears throat> A little bit uh, obsessive there. And I thought, you know, the only thing left that I haven't done is to figure out how to make the frame. I mean, how, how does that happen? How do all these tubes go together? And how do you figure that out? So with that, I... Uh, I started just kind of reading some books on frame building. A guy named Talbot had a great book called How to Design and Build Your Own Frame Set. You know, and, and I thought, that's something I want to do. At this point, I was living here in, in Rochester. And I just, you know, it was kind of crazy. I found a place where I could buy tubing and I found a, a place where I could get files. And I just kind of outfitted a shop and I thought, well, I'll just build a frame for me. You know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter, and I'll see what it's like. So in the process of doing that, I then had to learn about frame geometry and why were head angles what they were, seat angles and standover heights and things like that. I had a friend who uh, did a lot of work in welding, not brazing, but he was really familiar with oxyacetylene torches and stuff. So I conned him into helping me buy the right set of torches and teach me how to turn them on without blowing myself up in the basement or something. And, and yeah, it was literally homegrown. I just, you know, designed a jig, built a bike for myself, which at the, that time was an exact replica of my Schwinn Latour 12.2, which was my dream bike at that point. Uh, so I thought, I'm not going to go outside of the, of the boundary. Schwinn knows exactly what they're doing. I'll just build this bike exactly like a Schwinn, which is what I did. And later on, I found out wow, why did they do it that way when they should have done it this way? But, you know, it was a great place to start. And people saw me riding around on this bike that I built for myself and had painted by the local auto body shop. <laughs> and eventually people said, so, wow, can you build me a bike? 
And that was the beginning of it, really. Wow. <clears throat> what were some of the big changes you, you know, you saw that need to be made from your Schwinn to the bike you made for yourself? Small bikes right off the bat. I'm about 5'2". And in the beginning, Schwinn didn't make the Super Latour. And well, they never distinguished between men and women, but they didn't even make the bike small enough for me to straddle the top tube. I mean, if you know back then, top tubes were all horizontal. The idea of slope top tubes was a, a ways off. And finally, they came out with a 19 inch version of it. And I could just straddle that, but I bought the bike and that was the bike from then on. But the interesting thing was working on designs later, trying to figure out how to make them smaller and discovering kind of crazy stuff that Schwinn had done like 12 inch bottom bracket heights. Normally they're around 10 and a quarter or so, but they were doing that because they were married to a certain head tube length and they were married to a horizontal top tube. And that was the only way they could go. So, you know, I had to figure out how to get around things like that. Mm -hmm. It didn't lead me to a slope top tube until much, much later, because I, I really stuck with a kind of a traditional design. But then the other thing was just the reach to the handlebars. I have a fairly long upper body, so I didn't notice it really that much. But a lot of potential customers were always saying how stretched out they felt on their bikes, women especially, not really for men. And that led me to finding a builder by the name of Bill Boston who uh, out of uh, Connecticut, I think, Delaware maybe, who was at that time building a bicycle with a smaller front wheel than rear wheel because he realized he didn't have to compromise anything in terms of the bike's geometry to do that. It worked beautifully. It handled normally. There were no drawbacks. The rear wheel was full size, so the gearing was identical. But you could actually reach the handlebars, feel in control of the bike. And not only that, you could really lower the top tube for smaller riders because you weren't running into this issue of this big front wheel chunking everything up in the front end of the bike. So I talked to him about design. I really felt like that was his design. It turns out that design's been around since the 1920s or really early. They were used on track bikes with hmm. the front wheel actually flipped around the other way so a track bike could follow behind a stayer and get really close and get the draft. So the idea was around, but I, I said to him, I really, I'd love to build this design, but I feel really funny. I mean, this is a Bill Boston design. This is not a Georgina Terry design. Can, can I have your permission to build this? And he said, yeah, do it. Because until more people do it, it's not gonna be accepted. So that was that was kind of the beginning of it. I started using that on smaller bikes. Interesting. Um, do you why do you think is that you know in, that never really caught on in the industry overall? Because I feel like for the most part, you know, we are well, all into the same wheels. The industry is so crazy. I mean, you know, gee, if the front wheel is smaller than the rear wheel, I've got another SKU to worry about inventory-wise. And you know, I really don't want to do that. I'd rather figure out how to do it with two of the same size wheels, which they've done to some extent, you know, with 650C and now it's 650B. You know, they're slowly getting away from that saying, ah, eh, let's just go back to 700. That can take care of everything. I think what the industry did to some extent to try and address this problem was the introduction of the slope top tube, which I think came out of Giant originally, maybe. And, and to me, it was just kind of a backwards way of doing things. Yes, more people can straddle a slope top tube, more, more smaller riders can, but you still haven't addressed the issue of the reach to the handlebars. And not only that, now you're saying you can make fewer sizes because with the top tube sloped, more people can stand over it so you don't have as many skews. So it just kept coming from the wrong direction. It's like, what's cheapest for us? What, what's going to help us sell more bikes? What's the marketing angle? But to me, none of it was, what about the rider? I mean, we're building these bikes for riders, not for our business plan somewhere. Just, yeah, just didn't, I couldn't resonate to that. <laughs> it's the story of my life. I can't resonate to anything, but okay, keep going. <laughs> so was that like one of your inspiration then to start uh, Terry Performance Bicycles? Yeah, Terry Precision Bicycles. And the reason was, I mean, not so much, not as much to build the bicycles, but to get away from working for someone else. Because, I mean, this is a terrible thing to say in today's world, but I am not a team player. <laughs> <I am laughs> absolutely not. I mean, I, 
I recognize that as a weakness and I try and stay out of situations where I have to be a team player because it just doesn't work well. So I thought, boy, if I can just start my own business and do my own thing, that'll be perfect. I'll be happy. It'll be great. And yeah, that's what happened. Yes. So um, what was it like, you know, starting a, you know, a bike building company and, you know, entering that industry as a woman? Uh, it was, it was fine because I was flying so under the radar that I don't think any big companies really knew who I was. And if they did, it was like, eh, who is this little woman up in Pinfield doing these little bicycle frames? We don't need to worry about that. It, it was really exciting though, because when I started, there were a lot of huge bicycle rallies all over the United States, the Great Eastern Rally, the LAW National Rally, you know, and they would attract thousands of riders. So I could go with my custom bikes and set them up and let customers take them for a bike ride to see if they liked it. And that generated the sales. I was also incredibly lucky because as I expanded, I mean, I didn't really know anything about painting. I had to take the bike somewhere and get it painted. And there was a lot I didn't know about how to get into production mode with bicycles. One off, yes, but you know, you need to do more than that. And one day I was thumbing through, if anybody remembers here, the LAW National Bulletin, which came out every month. And you could look in the back and find all these ads and great bicycle rides. And I found this ad. This guy said, hey, I paint bicycle frames. Uh, you know, if you're interested, give me a buzz. And he signed it, Brian. And I noticed that the area code was on the eastern side of New York, up around um, Clifton Springs, not Clifton Springs, but further out north of Albany, that area, Boston Spa. So, OK, so I called this phone number and this woman answered the phone and said, hey, I'm calling about this ad. Brian put about painting. She goes, oh, yeah, hang on. Brian, somebody wants to talk to you. So this guy gets on the phone and he tells me, yeah, he's painted a lot of bicycle frames and he'd be glad to paint one for me. He wouldn't charge me anything for it. If I liked it, I could do business with him in the future. If I didn't, that was the end of it. And he told me all about what he was doing. I said, so like, who, who are you painting all these frames for? And he said, Ben Serrata. And I was like, oh, my God, you're the painter for Ben Serrata? Whoa. He, he said, yeah. He said, you know, and things are a little bit slow with Ben right now. So I'm looking for some other business. So he started painting frames. And then Ben's business still remained slow. And Brian called me one day and he said, you know, there are a couple of guys here who are really good frame builders. And if you're trying to build up the company, you might want to think about maybe bringing them to Rochester. So I talked to these two guys and they said, yeah, we'll come to Rochester. So they did, which was, was absolutely amazing. Uh, uh, they really kind of introduced me into more of a production mode kind of set up for hand-built frames. And, you know, at that point, then we could really produce some numbers and actually start getting some dealers interested in stocking them and getting a lot more publicity and getting known for what we were doing. What were you up, up to that point? Georgina, were you the sole person building? I had I had two and other guys marketing and everything. I had two other guys here who who were helping me who liked to bicycle but didn't know anything either. So we were all kind of learning together as we went along. And it really made a difference when we got Rob Stowe and Dale DeRoss from Serata into the company because they were like, no, 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 you don't do it that way, you do it this way. And that was, you know, then we had me and four other people building, and then we needed somebody to answer the phone and do that kind of stuff. So it just started to grow and grow and grow. Was it at that point, was it full custom? Were you taking only custom orders or were you actually developing a production of like stock frames? We were, we were in the process of moving from one to the other. We did, I would say about half and half custom and a stock line. We had about five styles in the stock line that we offered. Uh, and at that point, we really found people, most people were able to fit on the stock bikes and it was much easier in production because you could do a run of 10 or 15 at a time rather than one-offs. So yeah, we had five stock sizes, believe it or not. And of those, three of them had small front wheels and two of them were running 700 seat front and rear. Nobody was really thinking about 26 or 650 at all at that point. 
What year are we in right now? We we are in about uh, 1989, I would say. <laughs> we started in 84, we moved up to 89. And, and then what started to happen was that uh, <laughs> people wanted saddles and clothing and we're starting to push us in that direction and you know the thought was well if we're really going to be a women, company for women who want to get into bicycling shouldn't we think about expanding a little bit into those areas maybe we can have the same effect there that we're having with bicycles saddles was really the first new product outside of that and and that was you know the same kind of complaint saddles are uncomfortable just feel a lot of pressure in the wrong places uh, what can you do about that? So <laughs> the, an, the answer to that was a, a hole in the saddle, which again was not new. That was patented in 1930 by Fred Blake. And if you go back and read the patent, which is absolutely fascinating, he specifically referred to men's and women's genitals and the problems that saddles were causing. He wasn't distinguishing at that point between the sexes. It was like, we all have the same problem. We need this hole in the saddle. And he started producing a saddle with a hole in it. Quite interesting. <laughs> Leather saddles in those days, no padding. We have uh, several questions regarding fit, and so okay. when Bar. you, so you, you were do, you were doing custom orders at that point, but you also discovered what a good stock setup would be. So, what are some elements of a, a body size and shape that were important in developing the geometry of your bike, including like crank arms and even saddle uh, mm -hmm. shape and size? Yeah. At, at that point, well, first we look at body dimensions, like height of the rider, leg length, arm length, torso length, uh, just to see proportionately how they might fit on a bicycle. And yeah, definitely changing things where we could on a bike, like the width of the handlebars, smaller for smaller bikes, shorter crank arms, uh, even downsized brake levers, which some manufacturers were offering then. They, they, these weren't integrated brakes. These were separate brake and separate shift levers. And you could get smaller levers, which were fantastic, much closer reach to the handlebar, uh, which really helped a lot. We came up with a, a patent for a handlebar design at one time, which actually had a, a relieved area in the kind of crotch of the handlebar to let your hand get that much closer. It might have only been five millimeters or so, but you were that much closer to the brake lever. And that made a difference for some riders. Mm -hmm. uh, so those were the main things. I mean, eventually the body dimensions really translated into what should the length of the top two be? What should the width of the handlebars be? That kind of thing. Do you have like a particular part of bike design that you think makes like the biggest difference in fit or feel for people? Yeah, yeah. The the reach to the handlebars really is the most crucial thing. Fit, the standover is not so much of an issue these days with people like being more accepting about uh, sloped top tubes. That's rarely the issue. The issue is still that four to aft distance. I mean, I, I fight with that with virtually 60% of the designs I do, you know, because you always, when you build a custom bicycle, you really, versatility should be at the top of the list along with the fit, because I hope that you're going to be riding that bicycle 20 years from now, but probably 20 years from now, something's going to change in your physiology and, and a bike that was comfortable right now may not be comfortable 20 years from now. So we want to make sure can you put a different stem length on it? Can you change the position of the saddle? You know, those, those kinds of things, because yeah, a bike is a lifetime investment, I think. Especially if you're buying a custom-made bike, you would want it to be a lifetime. Yeah, <laughs> and especially if it's made of steel or titanium, <laughs> which were you is a whole working? other discussion we could have. But <laughs> Georgina, were you working as a sole developer at this point of these ideas or I what, yeah what I of, am I am because I sold I sold the company Terry Precision Bicycles to an investor in Vermont in uh 19 oh no 2009 I think and I retain the custom bicycle side of it so yeah what I do now is I don't build anything anymore I design everything and the bicycle is built by Waterford, Richard Schwinn's company. The irony of all this that I started with Schwinn and now I've come back around to a Schwinn connection. They do the building. And then I work with a local dealer with the customer 
send the frame and fork there, uh, buy all the components. We put it together exactly the way she wants it. And that's it's nice because the independent bicycle retailer gets the benefit of this as well. It's probably not a sale she was going to make anyway, given the price point and the nature of the custom bike. So it's added business for the shop, which is great. And I also have a professional fitting done, which is part of the bicycle's price because the fitting is so crucial and it's so developed this, this time in, in bicycling history than it was when I started. When I started, bicycle fit was really simple. I mean, could you straddle the bicycle? Yes, I can. Okay, the bicycle is pretty much the right size. If you held your hand horizontally and put the saddle nose at your elbow and the tips of your fingers at the ends of the handlebars, did they meet? If they didn't, the handlebars were either too close or too far away. So you would make that adjustment with the stem. You know, and then you check the saddle height. Is your knee almost completely extended when your foot's at the bottom of the pedal stroke? If you pass these three tests, the bicycle fits. I mean, it was just, it was so simple and so naive compared to what we do now, which is just radically different. And, and for the most part, really good, but it takes a super, super good fitter to understand how to use the tools that are available and make sense of them, rather than just reading the numbers off and going, okay, yeah, the number says this, there's more to it. <laughs> Do you feel like it's important for people, if they buy a stock bike nowadays to get a fit or? Yeah, I definitely do. I definitely do. And, and, and to me, a fit is not five or 10 minutes on the bike. That is not enough time for a really good fitter. To, to know what's going on. So if you're if you're looking for a stock bike, search search out a shop that really believes in the fit and how important it is and we'll spend the time to get it right. Awesome. So you had uh, talked a little before about, you know, making um, you know, mixed uh, I mean mixed wheel size bikes. I mean, we kind of talked a little bit before, but why do you think it seems like, you know, bicycle design has kind of gone a little bit further away from the tradition than it was before nowadays mm -hmm. with Jones and all these other companies. Um, you know, why do you think we see more all wheel size bikes besides no says skew? Is there still like a stigma about it, do you think? Yeah, I think there definitely is a little bit of a stigma about it. And I, I do think it still comes down to just trying to keep the cost minimized. But what else has happened is that people are becoming more interested in different wheel sizes. I mean, the 26 inch wheel size, which we long associated with mountain bikes is available in some, uh, boy, some drop dead gorgeous tires now that are, are narrower tires. And what is narrow these days? Narrow used to be 23 millimeters. Narrow now is 32 millimeters because we're, we're understanding that it's not a super high pressure skinny tire that gives you the most efficient ride as a rider. It's a more supple tire, it's lower tire pressure, it's a wider tire, uh, because we you really want the tire to be absorbing the shock, not the rider's body. But you know, you have this feeling when you're on a bike that has a high pressure narrow tire, it's like, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm really going fast. You're also being jolted to pieces in the process. But so, so accepting that. And then, you know, there is also the 650B size, which is somewhere between 26 inch and 700C that's making a comeback uh, a little bit. It's kind of interesting when you look at Canyon, for instance, which until recently offered a women's line of bicycles. And they did use a smaller size, but it was a 650B. They, they just didn't want to quite make the leap down to 26. And now they don't make women's bikes anymore. They just make smaller size bikes because women can ride anything. The only company that I know of that's really still hitting that market hard is live which is giant essentially it's a fully owned division of giant and they seem um, to be one of the like brands that have been doing it the longest as well but seem to be one of the more committed brands yeah absolutely i mean when you look at the money they spend into it they put their money where their mouth is they support women in cycling in all sorts of ways not to mention a really incredible professional bicycle team that's riding and hopefully they'll keep that up I mean, it, it would be great. My, my only thing that I really, I keep thinking about Liv, why don't you come down in your wheel size? Cause they're at, still at 700 C, they will not come down. And they just, they can't make that, that move for some reason. I mean, the owner of the company, the president of the company is a very petite woman, mm -hmm. but 
Yeah, I don't know what it is with these tires. It's crazy. So we know we talked a little bit about tires. Uh, I'm kind of curious a little bit, kind of curious to see your thoughts on or hear your thoughts on material because it doesn't seem like you work with like carbon fiber. You strictly steel only, or do you have other I, you like to work I, with? I offer steel or titanium. Okay. And uh, Waterford only builds steel bikes, so when I need titanium. Uh, I go to Philadelphia and use Belenke for building. He's building in titanium and is excellent. Um, but yeah, I, I really, I've owned a carbon fiber bike, a really nice one at one time. Calfee built it, so it was a really good bike. But I just, I just, I couldn't warm up to it for some reason, even though I had him build it to exactly the specs that I knew would fit me properly. And my naivety, I guess, is that I still don't, I'm not really totally trustworthy of the material. I, I am in forks, I think, more than anything, oddly. I mean, there was just a recall a couple of days ago for 9,000 carbon handlebars. Yeah. So. <laughs> we're tracking where the, the brake levers clamped on, which is understandable, I guess. Uh, aluminum, I've had bad experience with aluminum, uh, failures in aluminum. Uh, so I'm not interested in going that route. There used to be a really great ad. I think Chris Chance did it. Remember Fat Chance Bicycles? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He had this great ad when aluminum was really becoming popular. And, and the deal was it had something to do with a, an aluminum can. And he would take the can and bang, hit his head with it. And it would just crumple into nothing. And he's like, you know, is this really what you want to ride? I mean, I couldn't have done that with steel. I would have killed myself. But, you know. It's a great ad at the time we had the poster in our office because everybody was going why don't you use aluminum <laughs> because it breaks every time i ride it that's why <laughs> i saw this thing recently that was uh no i'll take anchors over tin cans over over plastic any day <laughs> oh that's great <laughs> i have I, to remember that one yeah <laughs> um so uh I guess uh, one question I have for you is, you know, you've made a bunch of different bikes. Is there a particular bike that you've made that you are, are particularly proud of or is your favorite or a style that you really love? Uh, wow. You know, they, I guess the style that I really like is is still the, the kind of classic conservative style where you eat, actually make a lugged frame mm. instead of taking it. I mean, those those looks to me just never go away. And I like I still like the simplicity of a caliper brake as opposed to a disc brake, although I realize that disc brakes are far superior in a lot of respects to caliper brakes. Uh, but but to me, the hallmark of the bicycle has always been it. There's nothing hidden about it, and everybody can work on one and and they're wonderfully simple. There's no need to make them complex. They do what they do so beautifully well, just in their original habitat, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But I happily build whatever anyone wants. I would say that 80% of the bikes I build these days do have disc brakes and about 40% of the bikes have electronic shifting. So, you know, that is where, and there, there's some great advantages to that. I mean, disc brakes work in any kind of weather. They open up the world to you when it comes to trying different widths of tires doesn't hold you back in that respect, easier hand action and electronic shifting. Holy cow. I mean, you know, sometimes you're trying to, to shift mechanically. It can be an issue if everything's not working well. It's just a little bit more hand pressure that you need. But with electronic, boom, 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 you just hit the buttons and go. So, yeah, it's great. Awesome. One of the one of, one of the topics we wanted to talk to you about was polio. And regarding polio, there is this world of adaptive cycling, which I think Electronic shifting has actually been a, a nice boon for, but yeah. as a polio survivor, uh, well, I mean, for a lot of us, we don't know that you are a polio survivor. So can you talk to us about what that experience was like and yeah. what the effects of surviving polio have done to change your perception and philosophy towards cycling? Uh, well, I have to say when I got polio, I was only two years old, so I don't have any memory of actually having it. And I was really fortunate to have parents who like just, you know, didn't dwell on it. I mean, for instance, if I said, I'm going to go climb a tree with the kids, 
they would say, okay, but don't be late coming home for dinner. You know, I mean, it would, I mean, they were probably like, oh my God, she's having a dream. <laughs> What's going to happen? <laughs> so it, it's cool. I think it's not cool. It's never cool to get polio. But when you get it as a little kid, other little kids don't notice it. You know, if you get it, I think as an adult or as a teenager, there's more of a stigma attached to it. And, you know, when I left the I'll say the security blanket of Montgomery, Alabama to go to college in Pittsburgh. I never thought of myself really as having polio. It was only when I got into a different world where people met me having had polio for the first time that they wanted to know, okay, what was it all about? And what's going on? So I, I've, I think I've been lucky, certainly when I had it, it's only really affected my left leg. And that means I'm pretty much providing all the power to the pedals through one leg, but in terms of balance and things like that, you know, it's really no different. So yeah, it's it's been okay. What really bugs me though is when people try to open doors for me, that just pisses me off. Let me just say something to everybody. <laughs> when you see somebody headed for a door with crutches, they can open the door. <laughs> don't, don't feel like you got to rush to the door and open it. I mean, it's nice and everything, but yeah. People usually don't need that. So <laughs> that's my pet peeve about having polio. That's about the only one. <laughs> that's awesome. Have uh, you done any work with adaptive cyclists? And actually, you know, funnily enough, I there? haven't, which is, is kind of interesting. Uh, and, and I think that, that if that opportunity existed, I would probably refer them to someone else who really has had experience doing that. Because that's, you know, a totally different learning curve. And everybody who's in that position, they're all different. So it's not like you just got a set path you're going to go down. Yeah, this is going to fix the problem. Everyone's, everyone's different and special. We just had a really interesting question, I think, come through chat. And I'm actually interested to ask you. Are there any non-bicycle things in your life, like nature, art, music, food, travel, et cetera, that have informed your approach to making bicycles, things that inspire your work that are not related directly to bikes? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think uh, just the appreciation of nature and of the environment, and that's always made me want to be a person who spends more time outdoors than indoors. And, and, and wants to let nature just do her thing and we should really stay out of the way and respect it and adapt to it. Uh, and, and all of that is spoken to me so much when I do bicycle, because when you're bicycling, you're, you are in the elements. You are so sensitive to things like wind and temperature and humidity and the sounds of birds around you or the animals you may see or the different flora and fauna. I think bicycling makes you a, a better citizen in that respect. I was riding with a friend of mine once. We were down at Blackwater and we're riding along and she looked at me and she said, did you feel that? And I said, yeah. What we both had felt was just a really slight change in humidity and temperature as a front came through. And I thought, you know, if we hadn't been ardent bicyclists, I don't think we would have been sensitive to this, but it was just immediate. Yeah, I felt it. You know, what do you think the weather is going to be like in an hour? Just really cool. Really cool. So hopefully that kind of answered the question. I think, and, it, and you said it came from Chatham, someone at Chatham? No, someone in the chat window. In the chat window. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Maybe in Chatham. <laughs> Could be someone from Chatham here. Yeah, I think... Uh, if uh, bicycles should be good environmentalists, because I don't know how you can be outside enjoying all of those things, whether you're mountain biking or gravel biking or doing whatever you're doing without appreciating the beauty of it all. That's wonderful. Um, one more question I have here in the chat that I think is also great is uh, from Abigail. Uh, she was wondering how often you got to work alongside other women. Um, did her... Did your uh, women-specific designs come mostly from personal experience and feedback from customers or input from other folks in the business? Uh, they came definitely from customers, for sure. I mean, when I first started bicycling and even when I first started doing the frame building, I, other than the fact that I had trouble straddling bikes and I needed a smaller bike, I never really thought that much about smaller women or about women in general. It was only until 
lots of women started coming to me saying they were uncomfortable on their bikes. I mean, when a guy wanted a bike, it was because he wanted to put these components on it or, you know, certain certain ways of painting the frame or whatever. But with women, it was, I am after comfort. I love the bicycle, but I really want comfort. And, and after I started hearing that from more and more women, I thought, why are all these women saying this? Are they different from men in some way that I'm not thinking about? And that led me to start looking at uh, women's anatomy in terms of lengths of their arms and legs relative to men. And, and, and just looking at the whole bell curve of sizing, you know, women start in much smaller sizes than men. And the bicycle industry was addressing the men's bell curve and not the women's bell curve and, and losing a significant chunk of their audience as a result of doing that. Um, ultimately, I ended up actually having a, a, a study done at Carnegie Mellon by a grad student there who was into human anatomy and dynamics and stuff like that. And I said to her, I don't, I don't think I'm doing this right, just looking at the anatomical links of limbs. There's something else going on here. And she actually got into the position of muscle mass on the, on the body of a man versus a woman. I mean, our skeletons may be fairly similar, but, but our muscle masses and our fats or whatever, they're all in totally different places. So when we're on a bicycle in the same position, we usually find that a woman is bearing more force in her arms and her shoulders and her lower back than a man is. And, and hence always saying, I feel stretched out. I feel like I'm putting too much weight on my arms. Yeah, you are, <laughs> which is why that kind of led me to go down this whole area of shorter top tubes. So even when I'm building a bike for a woman who might be six feet tall, it has a substantially shorter top tube on it than a bike I might build for a man that height. It's kind of, it's really neat stuff. Super. Um, yeah, I mean, do you, uh, so besides, you know, your, your, uh, your bikes, are there other bikes out there that, or any other brands out there do you think that's doing a good job? I mean, you mentioned Liv before, that's maybe addressing women's sizing and women's specific needs on bikes. Yeah, I think it really, it, it just kind of is live. I mean, when you start getting into the other brands, that's exactly what you get into, branding. I mean, bike for bike for bike, they all seem to be pretty much cookie cutter. And the only difference is what are the aesthetics like? And, and what is the shop like who's selling them? I mean, you may find a shop that's really, really good, has great people, you like the staff, that's important. And that leads you to that brand as much as anything. Mm -hmm. What about fit, Georgina? You mentioned that earlier and how important fit is. What, what should a person be paying attention to when they're talking to a shop and trying to gauge whether it's going to be a good shop for providing the fit details that you're actually looking at? Yeah, it's really, it's kind of tough because a lot of times when you go into a shop, you may not know how, how extensive a really good fit can be. And you may not know what things you should be looking at. So I would I would be looking for someone in the shop who is willing to spend a lot of time with the customer explaining why this is important. Why is reach important? Why is the extension of your leg important? Why is the position of the saddle, the tilt, all of that? How do all these things add up? And, and why are you very, you are an individual. You're not just one of many, many women. We you can take two women who are absolutely identical in every respect who may fit on bicycles totally differently just because of something going on and a good fitter can suss that out. But the other thing too is, I mean, I don't think there's too many shops like this around anymore, but a lot of times a woman would go into a shop and immediately be sold, shown the least expensive bicycle in the shop and usually a women's style bicycle. And it's just a totally different world now. So you got to find somebody you're just really comfortable with. If they don't seem to really care, they're not interested in it, then try another place. And definitely ask around, you know, what are your friends doing? What are other pe people saying about shops? That's really important. It, and I will say, it's great if there's a woman working at the shop who does some of that stuff, but it's not absolutely necessary. I mean, I work with as many female fitters as I do with male fitters. And the ones that are good are really, really good. It doesn't have anything to do with their sex. 
That's good to know. Here's some more questions that we have in the chat, in the chat window. Uh, did you ever work with Jeff Napper, uh, Napier of Rochester Bike Shop in Clinton <laughs> Avenue in Rochester doing any frame building classes? I, I did not, but I know who he is. Uh, and I think our paths may have crossed at some point, but in terms of the frame building, I was really self-taught with the exception of a friend, my Volvo friend who taught me a little bit about the torch. And I think some of that just reflects my, my attitude much stronger then than it is now of, I can do it myself, thanks, don't worry, I'll figure it out. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't have any direct interactions with him at the time. And what would you say to somebody now that would be interested in getting into frame building? Hey, go get a torch and some chemicals <laughs> and, and go for it. You so could, but you could also go to a frame building school because there are a lot of them around these days. Belenke, as a matter of fact, down in Philadelphia, teaches people how to build bike frames, how to design them, how to braze. And then there's a school, a Bicycle Institute, I think, something like that. I believe they're out in Portland. But yeah, there are a lot of places, you know, do some Google searching and, and go out it that way or teach yourself, <laughs> whatever you're most comfortable with. If someone's right. going to go down that road of being a, you know, frame builder, like what advice would you give them personally? Uh, it, just to stick with it, you know, you have to learn a lot of things. Not only are you thinking about geometry, but you got to learn how to work with a file and production cloth and, you know, eventually machinery to get stuff done. But the best way I think to start is doing everything by hand, because then you've got a real appreciation of what's going on. It's like, you know, I guess you should learn to bake the cake first yourself before you go out and buy one from a bakery that's already been cooked for you. You just, it, it really, you know, you make a lot of mistakes when you do it that way. And you always learn from your mistakes. I mean, I, the basement of my house when I first started, the corner of the basement was just littered with stuff that didn't work out. <laughs> Chunks of bicycles and tubes and stuff that I burnt to the point that, you know, the braze wouldn't even flow. It was, yeah, it was crazy. But yeah, I think working on your own is, is always a good thing and just learning it. And there are some good books out there. You can still track down Talbot's book as a used book. That I think is one of the most thorough ones. If we were to go down the rabbit hole a little bit here, did you ever develop your own lugs? And what was that process like? No, I definitely didn't do that because <laughs> the better lugs are all investment cast. Uh, that, you know, there were people who were doing that. Henry James out in California is really known for his investment cast lugs. But no, I didn't do that. And and I, I never really learned to do a lot with uh, just fillet brazing. I did do some bikes that were fillet brazed that I never sold. I just kind of wanted to play with because psychologically, it was kind of hard for me to believe that a fillet brazed joint would, would, would uphold more stresses than a lug joint. You know, so I would, I would do a fillet brazed joint and then just grab a sledgehammer and beat the daylight out of it to see where it would fail. And it never failed at the joint. The tubing just got the daylight speed out of it. There's kind of an interesting, when I got into this, I, I did a lot of looking around and got some technical bulletins from companies like Handy and Harman that did bracing materials. And they really got into depth about the engineering studies. I mean, when you think about it, in, in my case, and in a lot of builders cases, you're taking two pieces of steel, you're sticking them into a lug that's also steel, but you're quote unquote, gluing them together with silver. That I use silver on all of my frames, only brass in some areas. But silver has a much lower tensile and yield strength than steel does. So how is it that when you run tests on that joint, metallurgical tests, it is actually stronger than the metal that holds it together? It has to do with something called triaxial stress. But when I first read about that, I thought, wow, that's incredible <laughs> that, you know, but... Yeah, it's just, that's the stuff I love about this. So stay tuned for Georgina's uh, evening triaxial stress course on- Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the funny thing was Handy and Harmon really couldn't explain it either. They just kind of said, well, you know, it's not a well-known phenomenon, but it's triaxial stress. <laughs> One question just came in. Um, 
what was the process in developing anatomically appropriate chamois in shorts and saddles? And did you find that they were women specific or were they more body specific? Well, uh, let me address the saddle issue first, because I, I was never much of an apparel person. And if there's anybody here from Terry who can address the chamois issue and if Pat and Oaks is here, she can. Uh, but uh, the saddle issue, it, it, it just, it was, it see, women will complain about that problem, I think a lot more than men do. And because I was dealing mostly with women, if men were complaining about it, I didn't hear it that much, but the problem was always just too much pressure in sensitive areas. So from an engineering standpoint, it just seemed to make sense. Well, let's just get rid of anything in that area that, that can be in the way. Um, so it was, it was, you know, kind of a little trial and error situation deciding how much to take out. And then did you put an actual hole in it or did you fill it with a very material that's really compresses really easily and a cover that compresses easily so you don't have problems? Um, that was our first take. I mean, you only knew the saddle had a hole in it if you flipped it upside down and looked at the cutaway and the underside of it. Um, but our fear was that people would you know, we have some people who say, well, it looked like a toilet seat if it had a hole in it. Nobody wants to ride that. But of course, we know what happened in the end was that that hole actually became the sign of a really cool saddle, uh, not something that was weird. It's, uh, it's, you know, like I say, it was patented years ago by Fred Blake. But to this day, when I see, I was watching some cyclocross races the other night and just looking at the saddles they were riding and the bulk of them had holes in it. And every one of them I looked at, I said, you're welcome. Because <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, you know, everybody claims that. But, but frankly, other than Fred Blake, if we hadn't done it, I don't know if the industry ever would have done it. Awesome. Uh, well, let's one thing is speaking of industry, because uh, one question I have for you is, you know, what are some trends you see happening in industry right now? And what are some trends you'd like to see happen? We, I'd, I'd like to see the industry build smaller bikes. I still don't think they have a good handle on that. And I still think their small designs are a compromise because they just won't, won't go the limit with it. And I'm talking about wheel size for the most part to drive that. Um, uh, I think there's there's really been a lot of innovation in the disc brake and the electronic shifting. And I think it's neat seeing those products come into the market because they probably opened up cycling for some people who wouldn't have done it beforehand. Or, and now, of course, there's the whole e-bike thing, which is, that's like a, again, I think that's a fantastic idea because it will help people get into cycling who wouldn't otherwise do it. The question is, can we make sure that it's safe? Uh, I think probably someone like the Consumer Product Safety Commission is going to jump in and say, wait a minute, we need to have <laughs> some more rules and regulations before garages burn down and stuff like that, because, you know, we're just not specking the stuff properly. But that's great. I mean, as people get older and want to continue bicycling, why shouldn't they ride e-bikes? I mean, it, you know, it's not cheating. It's it's continuing to be out there. And uh, the more people are outside, and gosh, just think of it from a transportation standpoint. Get people out of their cars and look at the Amsterdam model. And you know, we need to be moving more in that direction. You're definitely speaking our language. <laughs> <Regina. laughs> um, so are we going to see a Terry electric bike anytime soon, do you think? Well, I, I'd have to go back to school into electrical engineering to do that. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think so unless somebody wants to take one of my designs and, and uh, you know, apply electric to that. I think they're, they're, that is almost such a specialized field that it needs to be undertaken in a specialized way. Um, who is it who's building out in Colorado? There's a guy who is building custom electric bikes right now, uh, Leonard Zinn. And if anybody is interested in going the custom route and wants electric, Leonard Zinn is the person to talk to. Ironically, he's 6'4", but his wife is really, really tiny. So he's very, he understands how important the bike fit is. They're pretty expensive, but you know, for someone who wants to go that route, he's there. 
So What's a typical bike ride for Georgina Terry like these days? What what type of terrain? What length? Where do you like to go? Do you like to commute? Do you like to go out in the country with a picnic? I'd, ra I'd rather be out in the country for sure. The further I can get away from cars, definitely. I don't trust drivers these days. You know, it's just changed so much. There, there just seems to be this attitude. It, just, it doesn't matter if you're driving a car, or you're on a bike. It's just about attitude. It's awful. Uh, my favorite rides, actually, I... I just go very locally around here on roads where I feel safe. But when I go down to Maryland, I kind of open it up a little bit and like to do half centuries back to back for several days in a row and just hear nothing but seagulls and see wide open space. And uh, that's to me, that's my ideal riding. I do like riding in Vermont as well. Uh, but again, that state has become just incredibly congested and roads where you used to be able to ride for miles and miles and miles that just doesn't exist anymore. I think that's because I heard a statistic that there are four times more drivers, more cars in Vermont now than there were 40 years ago. <laughs> and it shows. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, yeah, I guess um, <clears throat> one thing we know, we, I've seen a lot of growth and it is in the world of bike packing and no, touring has definitely come back more. Do you have customers now that are asking for bikes that are more designed towards that, that have more rack mounts and all that. Yep, absolutely. Because so many of my customers these days also want to get off the paved roads and away from cars. And they're just looking for every opportunity they can find to ride gravel or to ride things like the Katy Trail or different areas like that. So yeah, virtually every bike I make has to have the ability to run a wider tire, possibly fenders, certainly all the racks that kind of stuff. I mean, to me, the gravel bike is one of the neatest things to come along in a long time because it, you know, yes, it says gravel, but let's face it, it is an extremely versatile design. You can ride all kinds of stuff on that bike. I mean, maybe it worries the industry because if you, all you need is a gravel bike, it might hurt some of the other kinds of bikes. I don't know, but yeah, they're terrific, totally terrific. Well, you and need that's a huge market, huge. And I think for bicycle touring companies, it's huge as well because they can now start focusing on those areas. And the more they do, the more those kinds of areas are going to open up. Yeah, I think to me, it kind of goes back to what you're saying before about versatility in a bike, not only you know through fit, but also function as well. Yeah, yeah. I, it's just, I think the... The sad story in this country is that, I mean, it's great that we're getting the idea of going off off road and doing that kind of stuff. But, you know, there's still so much to be done in the way of commuting and just and just changing lifestyles and, and how we build communities and all of that. I mean, it, the bicycle can do so many incredible things, you know, not only save you money on gasoline, but get your your body in good shape at the same time. It's a great world. It's awesome. You, do you have any uh, big adventures that you are excited to share? Excited that you would be excited to share with us, as far as like something you'd like to accomplish in twenty twenty three? Wow! I actually no. <laughs> I I think it's just going to be working more and more with bikes, and you know, the more I do, the more I learn about proper bicycle fit. It, it's it's the gift that kind of keeps on giving. So hopefully I'm gonna continue to learn more in that direction and make my bikes even better and better. But but nothing nothing crazy on the horizon. No, not at this point. How much time do you spend, Georgina? That we're running very low on time, speaking of that, but how much time do you spend fiddling with your bikes on like, let's say a ride to ride basis, adjusting the handlebar height, switching out a drop bar for a flat bar, and experimenting with these different changes and how they affect the quality of your experience. Actually, I don't really spend that much time on my own bike doing that. I think because I've got it so dialed in, you know, it just seems to keep working a lot. But I, I think I spend more time in CAD programs, just fiddling around, looking at changes in geometry and how to, how to push the envelope a little bit to get to better fit and more versatile fit. You know, at some point, yeah, I got to build a bike for myself that that has electronic shifting and disc brakes and all that just to go down that route. Uh, but it seems like I'm so busy doing other stuff. I never quite get there. <laughs> but 
but I, I do love maintaining my bikes. That's, that's one of my favorite things to do. I mean, just spending an afternoon cleaning it and lubricating it and all of that. It's just like total zen. Uh, I think Eric, you're muted, but uh, we have a hand raised. Uh, uh, Lucas has a question. Eric, do you wanna? Are, are we wrapping up at one? I wanna be really succinct, but first of all, I wanna say, Georgina, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I think that you're the reason that I'm in the community at all. Um, and I'm wondering uh, how you came to the name of the symmetry for your bike that had the 24 inch front <laughs> wheel and the 700C in the back. I think maybe was that, that super was super ironic. Idea. It might have been our idea of a joke or something, but it's funny. The <laughs> symmetry, it. the symmetry in the smaller sizes did have the mixed wheel size, but it moved up to 700 C. Yeah, I'm not sure how we came up with that. Uh, somebody might have just said, you know, it's kind of a neat concept, and and maybe even though the bike doesn't look symmetrical, you feel symmetrical for the first time when you're riding it. That that's one of the fun things about bikes is figuring out what's the name going to be. Because the the name of the bike really says a lot about you as a company, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love it. Thank you so much. I thank you thank for you. everything you do. Thanks. <laughs> cool. Well, that is about, we are just about up for time. But uh, first I want to say, Georgina, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. It's been fantastic to hear about your story and your approach to bikes and just you no know, overall just being an inspiration to the community so thank you so much oh thanks for having me it was a lot of fun i really enjoyed it <laughs> the chat is full of appreciation for all the bikes that you've provided to the people out here so again big appreciation from everyone on this call oh good thanks everybody i couldn't do it without customers like you so that's great <laughs> Well, excellent. Uh, quick, just follow up note for everyone. Uh, we do have a few more of these webinars coming up for the next few weeks. Uh, next week, we have a snow biking one. And then we, oh, actually, well, no, we have our SATP webinar about the state active transportation plan, um, talking about commuting and so forth. Uh, we also have a few other ones, our snow biking one. And then on February 8th, we have Clara Brown, um, a Paralympian and Maynard um, to chat with us as well. So. Um, but once again, Georgina, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure and uh, we hope to see you around Maine sometime soon. Yep, you will for sure. Thank you. So long. Take care.